Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the last week. This one is pretty dense. So we have some rumors of Intel's graphics card potentially showing up in the next year. We'll see if that happens. Also, Z390 chipset block diagram detailed. Spoiler alert, pretty boring details. Uh, NVIDIA's got some interesting revenue trends pointing towards mining income being somewhat significant. And we also have data on what percentage of NVIDIA's business is gaming income as well. In case you're curious and thought that Deep learning and AI had been taking over NVIDIA's business. Proves out gaming is still massive. So we've got all that and a couple of more things for this week's news video. Before that, this video is brought to you by iFixit's brand new Manta driver kit. The iFixit Manta kit is a universal repair toolkit that includes 112 steel bits, redesigned from the ground up with longer necks for 4mm bits, allowing more precision when working on components. The $60 iFixit Manta kit has everything from pentalobe drivers to Y drivers and standard bits. Learn more at the link in the description below. First one is Intel. So they could be showing a GPU at CES 2019. Major word here, could, because this is basically a, a more or less leak to Tweaktown where Tweaktown has claimed that some of their source is close to the company. Note that there is a possibility of having a product in somewhat of a demo state by the end of this year or early next year, looking at CES for that timeline. Whether or not that happens, we really can't say right now. Tweaktown's been accurate sometimes and inaccurate other times with their leaks. So uh, I wouldn't, grain of salt for now, but it does look like Intel might have something to show. That does seem like an awfully aggressive timeline for a graphics card showing from Intel. If you're kind of new to this, they recently hired Raja Kadori, former RTG chief at AMD, Radeon Technologies Group. They hired Chris Hook, who was the marketing director over there, uh, and they have brought over some other talent as well. So. We'll see what happens, but that's the rumor for this week anyway. In additional Intel news, Intel Z390 chipset block diagram has been detailed now. So this is pretty simple. If we put up Z390 next to Z370, uh, it's kind of like spot the difference. Basically, Intel's adding wireless AC 802.11 support to the chipset specifically with Bluetooth 5 added to the chipset as well. That's the primary difference between them. So you don't necessarily need the motherboard to integrate different chips for it now. It can run off the chipset. Other than that, there's an Intel wireless AC adapter on the chipset and four more USB 3.1 ports, and that's it. So that's the Z390 block diagram. Now, the motherboards themselves, the platform can still have other differences like power delivery for eight core, for example, but the chipset looks like it's basically the same thing that we already know as E370. Next news item, Nvidia and their revenue. So Nvidia's latest quarterly earnings looked positive overall with a year over year revenue increase of 66% for record quarterly revenue but had one standout item on the listing, cryptocurrency mining GPU sales. The company tracked $289 million in revenue from GPU cryptocurrency mining sales. It's a little bit nebulous how this is defined because if you are an individual who's say buying 10 GPUs on Newegg that are only used for mining, it's kind of hard to know how they differentiate that versus gaming revenue where perhaps the 300 million in cryptocurrency revenue is from direct sales to mining companies or something like that. So a little hard to know and kind of nebulous, but their number is 289 million right now. And it kind of goes back to the gold rush days where the people making most of the money were the ones selling the pickaxes, in this case, the GPUs. Most notably, Nvidia breaks down its market platform revenues as on a table that we've got. The company has gaming revenue listed as the greatest overall still at $1.7 billion, constituting 53.7% of their total business revenue. That's impressive considering the company's tremendous efforts in professional spaces. Data Center generated $701 million or 22% of revenue with OEMs Automotive and Pro-V filling in the rest. Gaming is still huge here even though mining generated $289 million directly for Nvidia and not counting whether cards were tracked for gaming sales despite use in mining machines, it looks like gaming is still doing more volume overall. In other news, for the same report, NVIDIA reported a gross margin increase from 59.4% to 64.5% year over year, saw operating expenses increased by about $200 million, which isn't a ton, considering their operating income increased by about $740 million, resulting in a net income of $1.2 billion for the quarter, gross revenue of $3.2 billion for the quarter. And then in NVIDIA stock news, analysts are projecting that future downtrends in cryptocurrency, <laughs> hot topic, could affect the company's price targets. So as Reuters cutely tries to explain the situation, well, let's just quote them here, gamers use GPUs to play high quality video games. 
we're, we're on track so far. But NVIDIA's graphics cards are also used by cryptocurrency miners to, quote, build machines to solve the complex math puzzles that earn digital currencies, such as Ethereum and Bitcoin. Almost sounds like, uh, like some kind of Pavlovian thing. I guess maybe it is. Uh, so that's what they're saying. Analysts project that price targets are now between $274 and $316, depending, noting that data center sales were down, which was not a positive, but cryptocurrency more or less picked up the difference. And then also noting that if cryptocurrency remains volatile and goes down, there's concern that NVIDIA will be down overall. But uh, NVIDIA's response to that was that channel prices for our GPUs are beginning to normalize, allowing gamers who had been priced out of the market last quarter to get their hands on a new GeForce card at a reasonable price. So basically they're saying the reduction in potential cryptocurrency demand would allow for an increase in gaming demand, thus theoretically offsetting it. Next one, Ryzen Pro APUs. AMD this week announced its Ryzen Pro processors in the 2000 series, including APUs for Ryzen Pro. Most notably, we wanted to immediately point out that AMD told select press partners, not us, that its Pro series would be better binned than even the enthusiast parts. So if that's accurate and you can overclock these things, then uh, buying one of those would theoretically give you a better overclocking headroom than, than the enthusiast parts. Technically speaking, the Ryzen Pro processors on paper don't look a whole lot different from the desktop processors. The 2400G, for example, still running four cores, eight threads, still 3.9 gigahertz boost, and it's not really any different than the 2400G normal processor. The same is true for most of the other Pro chips, other than a few guarantees, like 18 months of software stability, two years of market availability of the Pro processors, three years of warranty, and then Andy's pushing an angle, trying to establish that its CPUs are no harder to deploy in a business environment and an Intel CPU, which of course is probably accurate. And other primary differences include mostly security features. So those are the main differentiators other than the alleged binning difference as well. Uh, if you're building a gaming machine though, go with the cheaper option, probably get desktop. Next one, net neutrality was in the news again the past few weeks. The push to restore net neutrality rules put into place under the previous administration has gained traction this week with Democrats in the Senate filing a petition to force a vote on the repeal of the FCC's new rules enacted by Ajit Pai, current FCC chairman. The Congressional Review Act is the exact tool that Congress and Ajit Pai's FCC used to reverse the Obama-era regulations, that is the 2015 Open Internet Order that banned blocking content, throttling paid prioritization by ISPs, and placed ISPs under Title II classification. However, Democratic senators have used the CRA to force a vote and potentially remove the recent FCC rules voted for in December. The measure is something of a long shot, as it would have to pass both the House and be signed by the President. Regardless, the effort is still noteworthy and has gained support of many tech companies, mostly internet-based, including Reddit, GitHub, Tumblr, Etsy, Netflix, and many other ones. Currently, the resolution has 50 senators supporting it, 48 Democrats, two Republicans. The 50 senators are looking for a possible 51st senator to pledge their support. What's more, forcing a vote would more or less require everyone to stand up and be counted, so to speak, and senators will either be for net neutrality or against it with potential implications for future elections. Uh, the CRA is currently considered to be the best hope for restoring previous popular net neutrality rules, but we'll have to keep an eye on it. And that's only included not to be political, but because it's internet and technology discussion. Next one, Antec's high current gamer bronze power supply line. Antec returned to power supplies recently with their high current gamer lineup, the gold PSU specifically, and they've added two new 80 plus bronze certified models to that lineup, the HCG850 and the HCG750, being the wattage. Uh, both are fully modular, use Japanese capacitors, and offer dual ball bearing fans. New power supplies are $90 and $100 respectively with a five year warranty. Corsair announced two new cases this past week, the Spec Omega RGB, which we previously looked at at CES, I believe, and the Obsidian 1000D. The former is mostly not noteworthy. It's the Spec o Omega. It's the Spec Alpha, basically, except RGB-ish. And we showed that at CES anyway. 1000D is a super tower aimed at anyone who wants two systems operating in tandem under one roof, basically. That's the idea of the 1000D. It's based loosely and actually primarily off of the design from the concept slate that we saw at Computex last year. And it uh, offers 18 fan mounts, Support for up to four 480 millimeter radiators. Telescoping radiators was actually really cool, by the way. Not particularly, this is a Halo product case. It's meant to get attention. It's not particularly practical or affordable. 
but the telescoping radiator support is actually really cool. Integrated Commander Pro and hinged tempered glass doors on both sides. It's a $500 case for the 1000D. Retailers currently show it out of stock. Next, Intel is requesting an extension for its Spectre NG flaws patch. This is one we reported on last week's episode. The Spectre NG flaws are different from Spectre. They are new attack vectors. So it was recently revealed that the Intel chips are vulnerable to eight additional Spectre variants, dubbed Spectre Next Generation, hence NG. Intel initially planned to roll out a patch for May 7th, but has requested an extension on that timeline. Intel's planning on patching the new flaws with two waves of updates. The first one's aimed at medium risk flaws and will roll out July 10th. And the second patch is for high risk flaws. Isn't It's not due until August 14th. Microsoft is purportedly also working on OS level patches. And unlike CTS Labs and their chaos, the German computer magazine, Heise.de, and their researchers appear to be working with Intel according to normal and responsible procedure. That is not disclosing the flaws to the public until the vendors have been given a reasonable amount of time to address those concerns and develop mitigations. So that's the news for Spectre and Meltdown lately. EK Waterblocks is releasing hard tubing water cooling kits. So EK has put together some new kits, this time offering hard tubing over the soft tubing normally provided and seen in their kits. The kits will include the EK Supremacy MX Universal CPU block, an EK Coolstream SE radiator, 240 or 360, EK Vardar F3 120 fans, an EK XRES 100 SPC MS PWM, it's a, it's a pump and reservoir combo, and uh, also cryofuel, which is just their concentrate that you add to the distilled water. Oh, and uh, also six 12 millimeter G one quarter tubing uh, compression fittings and four 500 millimeter lawn hard tubes included as well. So those kits, $280 for the HT240, $310 for the HT360. Gigabyte's next and they're entering the SSD market. So they decided to jump to the SSD market, making Gigabyte one of the few non-memory makers to offer a memory-based product by which we, we don't mean memory suppliers, just like not Kingston, not Corsair, any of them. So it's a new person to the business. Gigabyte plans to offer an assortment of products from NVMe drives to standard SATA SSDs with NVMe drives under AORUS branding. And for the time being, it's offering two SATA-based drives targeting entry-level gaming machines. The UD Pro series will see their first two models come in the form of 256 and 512 configurations with Fizon and Toshiba handling the controller and 3D TLC NAND respectively. There's nothing especially remarkable about the drives. Gigabyte will likely lean on competitive pricing and bundling options. To that effect, diversifying their portfolio with storage products could give Gigabyte options for bundling with motherboards and graphics cards. The new drives will cost $70 for the 256 gigabyte model and 120 for the 512 gigabyte model. Finally, hardware sales for the week. It's getting better. So 1070 Ti is one of the main ones to point out. We had a news article that ran on the site, didn't go on the YouTube channel, that basically was titled something to the effect of NVIDIA releases press release about two-year-old graphics cards being available at MSRP. And we appreciated their press release because I don't keep daily tabs on the prices. So uh, yes, it's true. They are falling down in price to about what they should be. So the 1080 is around where it was when it launched two years ago. It's something. And the 1070 Ti is down to $500-ish. It's $500-520, which is not horrible, all things considered, the last few months. So there's an EVGA 1070 Ti at $500. We'll link it in the description below. There is an MSI 1070 Ti also available between 500 and 520, depending on what you're looking at. Obviously, prices can change, all that stuff. And then a Threadripper 1950X, which is a processor we highly recommend for the, obviously the use cases you want it for, is down to $880. Not the best price it's ever been, but it's still pretty good. Uh, so if you really need it, then we can recommend it. It's just not everyone needs that kind of power. So that's it for the week. As always, subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly and store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our mod mats or one of our very cool 3D logo laser engraved to tear down crystals which is just a, a solid piece of glass as this one back here weighs about three pounds. Uh, we considered actually putting it up here, but I was worried about it falling on my head. So that would be bad, although it'd get a lot of views. Maybe we should do that. Check back next time. I'll see you all then.